This is part two of the Emergency First Aid Video Library. Hi, I'm David Burney, and I'd like to welcome you back to part two of the First Aid Video Library. With me is Dr. Barry Heller. He's an emergency physician at St. Mary's Hospital in Long Beach, California. Welcome. Dr. Heller, we've talked a little bit about uh, the loss of blood in uh, cases of trauma, but we haven't talked about severe bleeding. Can you address that? Well, first, I think it's important to differentiate between bleeding, which is not life-threatening, and severe bleeding, which mm -hmm. can lead to a condition known as shock. Shock is a life-threatening situation and must be treated promptly. Well, suppose you, you come upon a victim who's conscious, he's alert, and the bleeding doesn't appear to be severe. What do we do? Well, if the victim is conscious and alert and the bleeding has stopped, then the situation is probably not an emergency. Uh, if the bleeding has not stopped, then have someone call 911, and you should apply direct pressure using a sterile cloth or a gauze pad directly onto the wound. Now, if the injury occurs in a limb, say an arm or a leg, then it's helpful to elevate the limb while you're maintaining direct pressure. Sometimes the cloth or the gauze can become soaked through with blood. It's not necessary to remove it. Just add a new cloth or gauze compress to the soaked ones and continue direct pressure until help arrives. Now, while controlling the bleeding is important, it's more important not to neglect the ABCs. What about uh, internal bleeding, bleeding you can't see inside the body? Well, in some cases, severe bleeding can uh, actually occur internally, uh, meaning that the blood loss is inside the body and you can't actually see the blood. Internal bleeding may occur with uh, a fall, an accident, or an injury to the body, uh, but may also come with a medical problem, such as a bleeding stomach ulcer. Mm -hmm. A victim of internal bleeding can very quickly go into a shock situation, and shock should always be treated as a life-threatening emergency. Well, that takes us into a subject that we're going to deal with in the next chapter. But before we do that, are there any questions from the studio audience about what we've covered so far? Yes, sir. Yes, my 10-year-old uh, son came home uh, the other day from football practice, and uh, his face was covered with blood. Is there any possibility that he could have gone into shock? Well, probably not. Uh, usually wounds to the head and the face uh, tend to have a lot of visible bleeding because it is on the face. But because that area is so easy to compress with the pressure dressing, as we talked about earlier, the chance of that developing into shock is probably very low. Thank you. Well, why don't we recap our chapter on bleeding? To review, Chapter 5 on Severe Bleeding. For severe bleeding, make sure that it's safe to enter the area. Then check the victim's ABCs and control the bleeding by applying direct pressure. Call 911. If you don't understand any of these procedures, please review this chapter. Dr. Heller, you mentioned that uh, severe internal bleeding can cause shock. Now, you know, I, I've heard about shock, learned about shock since I was a child. As a Boy Scout in the first aid course I had in high school, college, you know what? I don't know what shock is. Can you explain it? Well, I'll try. Um, let's start this way. In order for your, uh, the cells of your body to function, uh, they must be supplied with oxygen. Now, the blood circulates through your body and supplies the tissues and the organs of your body mm -hmm. with oxygen. Uh, the blood also acts as a conduit to take waste away from cells and organs and take them to the place where they can be cleansed out of the blood. Now, shock occurs in any situation where not enough blood is coming to the tissues and organs or not enough blood uh, is leaving those tissues and organs. Now, in order for you to use the air that's around you to supply your organs with oxygen, your respiratory system must be functioning correctly, and your uh, cardiac system, your cardiovascular system, must be functioning correctly. Now, if either of those should fail, then you would be in a shock situation. For example, if you have some sort of heart disease and your heart is not pumping enough blood, right. um, obviously your tissues will not be supplied with enough oxygen. Uh, in another situation, if you've had a, a lot of severe bleeding, there just isn't enough blood in your body to be pumped through the system. Um, another situation might be dilation or enlargement of your blood vessels, and, or perhaps your blood is just not getting enough oxygen, which might be due to a respiratory illness of some sort. All right, that's sort of the physiology of it. What are some of the signs of shock, the external uh, visible signs? 
Well, the signs and symptoms of shock are basically a patient that uh, may be anxious, there may be a rapid and weak pulse, uh, the patient may be perspiring, but usually has a cold and clammy skin. Uh, the skin color is often uh, pale and bluish. Uh, the patient may complain of thirst. Uh, there may be some nausea. The patient may have just vomited. Um, and in some situations, the patient uh, may have eyes which appear dull or dilated. And, uh, in some cases, the pa victim may even be unconscious. Difficulty in breathing, is that one of the, one of the signs? Certainly, difficulty right. breathing, rapid, shallow breathing can also be a, a sign of shock. They all sound like conditions that, uh, when seen, especially in a, in a cluster, need immediate attention. What, are, what is the first aid for this? Well, the first aid for a shock vi victim is very simple and straightforward, but very, very important. First, it's important to have someone dial 911 to get emergency help immediately. Uh, then you should make sure of your ABCs, as we've noted before. Okay, why don't we take a look at uh, some of the techniques for dealing with shock. If the victim doesn't have leg or back injuries, elevate the legs. This takes advantage of gravity and blood flows from the legs to the brain and the internal organs where it's needed. Next, maintain the victim's body temperature by covering them with a blanket. Do not give any liquids by mouth. One thing I should warn you about is not to place a pillow under the head of a person who is suffering from a serious emergency. The pillow can push the head forward and the tongue can fall back across the airway. In all cases, you'll need to protect the victim's airway. Right. Well, are there any uh, questions from the studio audience about shock? Yes, ma'am. Uh, why shouldn't we give a shock victim something to drink? Well, that's a very good question. The main reason is that a shock victim's level of consciousness is often altered and the victim will not be able to handle the liquids well, be able to swallow them correctly, and the danger is that those liquids will actually get into the lungs and can cause uh, pneumonia and other very serious problems. Any other questions? Um, yes, is yes. this like the same kind of shock, like an electrical shock? Uh, that's a very commonly asked question, and the answer to that is no. Uh, electrical shock is a direct physical injury to the cells of the body. Not quite what we've been talking about here, but we will cover that question in more detail in one of our later chapters. Thanks very much, Dr. Heller. Now, why don't we recap our chapter on shock? To review, chapter six on shock. For a victim in shock, make sure that it's safe to enter the scene. Check the victim's ABCs. Call 911. Lie the victim down. Elevate the victim's legs if they are not injured. Maintain the victim's body heat. If you don't understand any of these procedures, please review this chapter. You know, when I was growing up, having a broken bone, your arm, and a cast, you know, it was a great excuse to get it autographed by the best-looking girl in school. But it, broken bones can be a very serious matter, can't they? Well, certainly they can. For example, in a uh, trauma situation, you can break more than one bone. But most broken bones, or what we refer to as fractures, occur without any other trauma. Um, and most broken bones do not require immediate um, treatment. However, I think um, all kinds of fractures do require some sort of medical attention. Mm -hmm. Well, I understand there are compound fractures and simple fractures. Would you like to discuss those, if you would, in detail? Sure. We talk about closed and open fractures. A closed fracture means that the skin overlying the bones which have been broken is still intact. Right. Whereas an open fracture means that the skin has been broken right at the area where the bone has been fractured. That often is caused by the sharp end of the broken bone protruding up through the skin. Also, if you have a uh, fracture that occurs in a serious traumatic situation or a fracture which involves the neck or the back or the spine, those fractures should be considered very serious emergencies and those should require prompt, immediate medical treatment. For the most part, though, most, uh, most broken bones do not require immediate treatment, but I think all fractures should probably be seen by medical personnel within an hour. Well, all right. What, what can we do in the meantime until we've got that, uh, that person in the hospital? Well, in the meantime, there are several steps. First of all, you want to take in the whole picture, uh, make sure that the scene is safe to enter. Secondly, you want to check the victim's ABCs. Uh, you want to call 911 or the appropriate emergency number in your area for medical services. Uh, you don't want to move the victim unless the victim is in some immediate danger from the environment. Um, don't handle or try to straighten the fracture. Keep the victim comfortable, preserve the body heat, and wait for the arrival of the EMS personnel. 
What about a, a severe fracture, but it hasn't broken the skin, but clearly there's internal bleeding? Well, in that situation, it's important just to immobilize the fracture and keep uh, further injury from occurring, mm -hmm. such as that uh, closed fracture becoming an open fracture. Okay. Well, most of that seems fairly simple. Well, it is. Medical treatment of uh, fractures is, uh, is very complex, but we're talking about first aid here, and first aid is really very simple. The key is just not moving uh, the injury or the victim and right. making the fracture worse. Right. Okay, I think I saw a hand here in the uh, audience. Uh, yeah. Yes. What if you haven't broken the bone, but rather just dislocated your shoulder? Is it okay to try and pop it back in place? Well, I would answer that by saying only if you are a trained medical personnel. And if you're very courageous. <laughs> That's true. Uh, they can be very painful. But the main reason is that you can actually do more damage if you don't know what you're doing. And basically, it's best to just immobilize the area just as you would a fracture and obtain proper medical treatment. Anything else? Other questions for Dr. Helen? Yes, ma'am. Um, yes, what about sprains? Well, basically, um, sprains are difficult to differentiate from fractures without obtaining medical attention. So I would say in that situation, you would treat a sprain just like a fracture until you can obtain uh, proper medical attention. Right. Dr. Heller, thank you so much thank for you. being with us today. Now, why don't we take a moment to review what we've learned about broken bones. To review, Chapter 7 on broken bones. As in all cases, make sure it's safe to enter the scene. Check the victim's ABCs. Call 911. Keep the victim from moving, and keep others from moving the victim. Wait for official rescuers to arrive. If you don't understand any of these procedures, please review this chapter. Nearly two million burns occur each year in the United States. Now, of those, about 200,000 require hospitalization. Most of those burns occur in the home. Why? Well, perhaps because of this, a battery that's not working in your smoke detector. Something this inexpensive and easy to replace could make the difference between escaping a fire or not. Our next guest, Debbie Lawrence, is a firefighter and a paramedic. She's also a registered nurse. Would you welcome, please, Debbie Lawrence. Thank you for being with us. Debbie, with so many burns each year in this country, what, what are the major causes of burns? Well, when we look at causes, it seems that over 90% of the, fire, the burns that are caused come from fires or hot liquids. In first aid, the most important thing we have to do is immediately stop the burning. Put out the fire. If water is available, put the burned part in cool water. This will help stop the burning action as well as maybe decrease the pain. What, what, why is a burn so painful? Well, if you look at the skin, every square inch of the skin has literally thousands of nerve endings in it. And when the outer protective layer of skin is damaged, these sensors do what they're supposed to do. They send a message to the brain telling it to get away from whatever's burning it. Uh, are there different types of burns? I mean, we've all heard about first degree, second degree, third degree. Could yes, you run through they, that, please? they classify them pretty much in three stages, the first degree, second degree, and third degree burn. First degree burns are the least serious. They're uh, painful, as we know a sunburn to be. Um, they cause minor tissue damage and will heal usually in a few days. A second degree burn is a little more serious and it usually causes the skin to blister. A third degree burn is called a full thickness burn because it burns through all layers of the skin, including the nerve endings. Right. That makes the burn not painful at all. Debbie, it's my understanding that uh, second degree and especially third degree burns can be absolutely devastating to the internal organs or to the system in general. Can you explain that? Well, first we need to recognize that the skin itself is an organ, just like the heart or lungs. In fact, it's the body's largest organ. It does several vital things for us, like protect the body from infection. The skin is a washable barrier against bacteria and viral agents. Even though it's washable, it's also waterproof, and it keeps water from getting to all the muscles and other working parts just below the skin's surface. Now, what happens when there's a, a break in that surface uh, caused by a burn? When the skin surface is disrupted due to a burn injury, it leaves the door open for infection. At the same time, the body's reacting to an injury to its largest organ, and that reaction can throw off many aspects of the body's delicate chemical and fluid balances. This makes the body even more susceptible to infection. Burns should not be taken lightly, and any burn that involves the face, hands, feet, or groin is considered a second or third degree burn. Any burn bigger than the surface of your palm should be evaluated by a physician because of the complications that can result. 
Okay. Um, are there any questions from the audience? Uh, y yes. Uh, speaking of fires, earlier Dr. Stanler showed us how to hold a person's head still after they've been in an auto accident. Isn't that kind of dangerous? I mean, the car could catch fire. Well, in spite of what you may have seen on television shows, less than 1% of all car crashes result in fire, and they don't blow up like you've seen. Unless you see smoke or fire or spilled gasoline underneath the wrecked car, it's best not to move the head of the spinal injured person until the official rescuers arrive. Yes. Hi. Um, last week, my roommate was cooking, and the oil that she was using overheated on the stove and caught fire. And to put it out, she poured water in it, and it spilled all over, and the flames got all over. Mm. Um, is there a safe way to deal with a cooking oil fire? Sure. Uh, grease fires are one of the most preventable but common causes of, of burn injuries in the United States. Um, something else I'd like to mention, just while we're talking about cooking, is to remind people not to wear loose garments when they're cooking over a stove because it can catch on fire real easily. And as well as if you have children in the house, make sure any pot handles that you're cooking with are turned into the stove so that they can't reach up and pull the hot pot down on their head. Now you said don't put water on a grease fire. How do you put it out? A uh, grease fire, if you put water on it, the water turns to steam. Cooking oil is at uh, above 212 degrees when it gets ready to burn. And if you put water onto that, it will immediately turn to steam. It expands at a ratio of over 1,000 to 1 and spatters cooking oil everywhere. The best way to put out a cooking oil fire is to simply put a lid on top of it or turn off the heat source. Remember, if you're going to put the lid on top of it, however, don't get close enough to catch Loose on fire. Loose clothes, right. right. Speaking of clothes, uh, you read frequently about children, especially children who have managed to somehow uh, catch on fire. Their clothes are on fire, they're badly burned. Uh, what's your advice in a situation like that? Well, right now there's an excellent program being offered to elementary school children around the, the country by fire department. Mm -hmm. It teaches children to stop, drop to the ground, and roll to put out the flames. I understand we have a demonstration, so why don't we move over here. And a guest. Uh, Jamie McKinnon, is that right? Mm -hmm. Meet Debbie Lawrence. Hi. Nice Hi, Jamie. to have you here. Okay. I understand you're going to help us demonstrate this technique. Okay, if your clothing catches fire, the first thing you're going to do is come to a stop. You're not going to run. You're going to drop to the ground, with your hands over your head, and you're going to roll. You're going to keep your hands over your head so that the flames aren't anywhere near your face, and you're going to keep on rolling until the fire's all the way out. Jamie, good job. Thanks very much. Okay. Okay. We'll see you a little bit later. Mm -hmm. Okay, one of the most important things you have to remember once the person has dropped to the ground and is rolling is if you have water immediately available to put water on the clothing that is still smoldering. You want to put that out as soon as possible. Sure. If you don't have water available, the next thing you need to do is cut all the clothing that has been burned off. But if it's stuck to the skin at all, leave that alone. That has to be removed by the professionals in the yeah, emergency room. Yeah, I imagine that would not only be painful, but dangerous. What about uh, smoke inhalation? Suppose this whole thing is taking place in a very smoky area. Um, you have any advice here? Well, again, you have to keep the area, the environment safe for both you and the person you're trying to rescue, because you can't do them any good if you get hurt. If the person is large, unconscious, or unable to walk, the best thing to do is roll them onto a blanket and then drag the blanket out of the room. And then you just check your ABCs like we've done before. Mm -hmm. Check to see if the victim is breathing and has a pulse. If he is not breathing and does not have a pulse, you need to call for help and begin your CPR. But if he is breathing? Uh... If he is breathing, the next thing to do is take your hand and check to see if his skin feels warm, where the burn is. And if it feels hot, that tells you that there's still burning action going on underneath the skin. You need to get a hold of whatever kind of water you can and pour it on the skin to stop that action. Well, what about the temperature of the water? Does that matter, or you should just do the best Any you can? Any type of water, yeah, right. whatever you can get a hold of. Okay, there's a whole other category of burns uh, uh, that we haven't talked about, and that's chemical burns, which I guess are, are very different. Yeah, chemical burns are caustic. They burn the skin by a chemical action, not by heat. And the most important thing you need to do is get that chemical off the skin. The best way to do that is get a hold of a garden hose or put the part under a faucet to flush the chemical off the skin. And you need to do it for 20 minutes, 30 minutes, until your medical professionals get there. Either to dilute it or wash the skin completely right. clean. All right, uh, what, what do we apply to burns? I mean, there's a lot of talk, you know, when we were growing up about butter, about different kinds of ointments. That's one of the worst things you can do. You're going to delay treatment for the person Perfect. at the right. hospital. If you do that, don't put butter on it, don't put margarine on it, don't put any ointments on the burn. 
It'll only cause further damage to tissue that's already been hurt. And it just, uh, it's another chemical to wash off. That's correct. It just uh -huh. delays treatment. Along with that, don't put ice on a burn. It'll cause more damage to tissue that's already been insulted. Another situation that is apparently very complicated are those situations involving electricity, electrical burns. But also the rescue or the contact with someone who's been involved in an electrical incident. How do we, how do we approach that? Again, the first thing you have to think about is safety. You can't help anybody if you become a victim. If the person is attached to the electrical source, the first thing you must do is call 911 and get the fire department out there to disconnect the person. Don't approach that person. Let the professionals handle it. And if the person is not involved directly with the source if of electricity? If the person is not involved directly, you're going to start, as you always do, with your ABCs. Check for the breathing. Check for the pulse. Electrical injuries can be kind of sneaky because we don't always know where the current's been or what it's damaged. It can enter the hand here, travel through the body, come out the foot, and you don't know what organs it's touched. You can have all kinds of internal damage there. Right. right. It can stop the heart. Uh -huh. It can make it can be beat irregularly. It can go up in the brain and cause a seizure. So you just don't know. And if they're conscious? Uh... If they're conscious, you're going to treat them like a heart attack victim because you don't know where that current went. You're going to sit them down, reassure them, any burns that they have, you'll treat as we talked about treating burns, cool water. Call the EMS professionals and get the person transported to the hospital. All right. Debbie, thanks so much. This has been really informative. I know you're going to be joining us later to talk about other kinds of temperature-related injuries. But until then, why don't we recap Chapter 8? To review Chapter 8 on burns, make sure that it's safe to enter the scene. Stop the fire or burning process. Check the victim's ABCs. Call 911. Do not put ice, ointments, butter, or similar substances on burned skin. If you don't understand any of these procedures, please review this chapter. Every year, some people die, and many people suffer serious injuries due to overexposure to the cold. That creates a condition that's called hypothermia. Debbie, what, what is hypothermia? Hypothermia is a condition that exists when the body is unable to produce enough heat to maintain its vital functions. The very young and the very old are most at risk for this condition. Mm -hmm. what, what are some of the signs of a hypothermic person? Signs and symptoms of a person suffering from hypothermia may include shivering, numbness, drowsiness, slowed breathing and pulse, failing eyesight, and coordination difficulties, which may show up if the person is trying to walk and staggers. All right, so uh, using those signs, if we're able to identify a victim of hypothermia, how do we proceed? What are some of the first aid techniques? Well, the first thing you need to do is get them into a warm and dry environment. Mm -hmm. You need to check their ABCs and call the 911 professionals to get them responding because it can be a life-threatening emergency. All right, another condition that's common to the cold, frostbite. Can you talk about that for a bit? Well, just as heat damages the skin's protective covering, frostbite does the same. Let's look at an illustration of skin and see the effects of frostbite. Frostbite occurs when a person is exposed to cold without adequate protection. It results from tiny ice particles forming in the skin and other tissues. Those areas which are most prone to frostbite are the ones that are most exposed. Fingertips, ears, nose, lower extremities, especially the feet and toes, are very prone to frostbite. Right. Well, what are some of the signs of frostbite? Well, frostbite usually occurs painlessly. In the initial stages, there is no pain and you don't feel anything. The first symptom that a person may have they're getting frostbite is their fingers and toes may lose their flexibility. Oh, that's very dangerous, isn't it? I mean, you can, you can be out skiing or something and not even be aware of uh, the condition that's encroaching. And once it gets in the advanced stages, you still have no pain. The skin may look waxy and may feel hard to the touch, mm. but you're not really aware that you're getting it. Well, suppose we are able to identify it. What's, what's the treatment? What do we do? Well, you need to get the person into a hospital because it can cause you to lose limb uh, function. You can actually have to have uh, body parts amputated because of frostbite. If there's a delay in getting the person to the hospital, you can, if you have water available, put the part that's been exposed to the frostbite into warm water. The water temperature should be between 100 and 105 degrees Fahrenheit. Ideally, you mean Ideally, to try yeah. to get it right there. Yeah, that's yeah. kind of tepid water, huh? Yeah. yeah. And uh, you just leave it in there uh, to rewarm it. 
it will start probably, ideally, turning pink right. and start to hurt. And if it starts to hurt, you know you're starting to make some progress. Right. Is there anything that, uh, that we shouldn't do uh, in terms of treating frostbite immediately? Well, let me say just one more thing about the first aid. Um, if the skin starts to blister or uh, shows any signs of, of any damage, you need to pad that very carefully as you're taking them into the hospital emergency room. Right. As far as things... Is there anything that we, we shouldn't do in terms of treating frostbite? As far as things not to do, the main thing is not to rub the tissue with snow or ice. Um, you may have heard that and, and the mm. old westerns throw that, but that's not something you want to do. Um, you also don't want to give the person any alcohol or allow them to smoke because nicotine can decrease the circulation uh, to those uh, extremities that have been exposed to frostbite. And lastly, you don't want to take and put the person's hand or foot over an open flame. Okay. Um, any questions here from the audience? Yes, ma'am. If there's no water available, what else could we do to help with frostbite? Well, your priorities are getting the person into a warm environment and getting them to the hospital as soon as you can. If there's not water available, one of the best things you can do is put their, uh, the extremity, the part that's been frostbitten, into an area that has a lot of circulation, which would be under the arms, possibly in the groin. If you have a sleeping bag or a jacket, you could bundle the person in, bundle around that extremity, and get them to the emergency room as soon as you can. All right. Thanks very much, Debbie. That's good information, and I appreciate you being here. Now, let's review some of the things you need to know about frostbite and hypothermia. To review, Chapter 9, Cold Emergencies. For a victim suffering from hypothermia, first make sure it's safe to enter the scene. Check the victim's ABCs. Call 911. Then, move the person to a warm and dry environment. Do not allow a victim to smoke or drink alcohol. For the treatment of frostbite, as in all emergencies, make sure it's safe to enter the area. Check the victim's ABCs. Call 911 or transport the victim to the nearest hospital. If possible, immediately rewarm the affected area by immersing it in water heated to 100 to 105 degrees Fahrenheit. Do not rub the frostbitten area with snow or ice. Do not allow a victim to smoke or drink alcohol. And do not apply direct heat or place the affected area over an open flame. If you don't understand any of these procedures, please review this chapter. Welcome to Chapter 10 of the Emergency First Aid Video Library. This chapter is entitled Poisoning. Here with us again is Baxter Larman. Baxter, in your experience, you've seen a lot of accidental poisoning, haven't you? Yeah, as a rule, David, uh, accidental poisoning is about uh, 2 to 3 percent of the total responses that we run on um, as paramedics. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting to see that a lot of these can be life-threatening and that all kinds of other complications can happen because of them. So it's real important that the, the numbers uh, that, that seem small can actually be life-threatening. During the break, you were telling me that there were a number of household items, and we have some of them here on the table. All of these, I see some cigarette butts, there's some alcohol here, there's some Drano, some all. All of these are potentially dangerous to a very curious child. That's right, and, and a lot of them um, that are around your house, people don't even understand. Like a simple thing like a, a plant right here can, can make a person real sick. Alcohol is very common, that it's not kept hidden away from the children. And over and over again in these videos, one of the things that we keep talking about is prevention. Now, do you mean wine and, and uh, strong spirits as well as rubbing alcohol? Well, and beer and wine is not what I'm really worried about, but I had a situation of a child that almost died from a simple thing, which was vermouth. Vermouth almost killed a small amazing, child. Amazing. So, you know, it, it's amazing that a lot of these things that we don't seem to be um, life-threatening need to be hidden away. Yeah, prevention is clearly the situation. But exactly. suppose we've done that job badly as uh, parents or adults and uh, stuff has been left around and we have a poisoning victim. What do we do? Well, basically, the thing that we need to remember is, is that these people need to have those basics done. And the basic first aid is real easy to be able to do. All we need to do is, first off, when we come up to a person that may have a suspected overdose or a poisoning, 
is to look around the environment and make sure that the environment's safe. Now, the poisoning may be an environmental poisoning as well, and we don't want to take a chance of injuring ourselves when we come into that environment. So what might be more important is to remove the person rather than trying to take care of them right there at the so scene. So you're looking at that entire area for clues, though, about what's going on. Right. So okay. that's the first thing that we're going to do. And then we need to establish if they're conscious or unconscious, mm -hmm. just like always. So we're going to come up to the person and shake and shout at them. If the victim is unconscious, what we need to do is make sure we shout for assistance. After we've shouted for that assistance, we want to maintain that airway. We tip that head back, and we're going to listen, look, and feel to find out if the person is breathing. In this case, the person is breathing, but if they weren't, we'd want to go ahead and give those rescue breaths. Also, we'd want to make sure that the 911 system was activated as soon as possible. Now, we continue to monitor the patient until help would arrive. But in many cases, poisoning patients get very upset stomachs and actually can vomit. And if the patient vomits in this position, that vomitous material can go and down into their lungs. So what we want to quickly do is we want to rotate the victim to the side as quickly as possible. We want to keep their head back and we want to dig out all that material that we can out of their mouth and as quickly as we can. We rotate the victim back over, we keep their head back, and we're going to monitor to make sure that they're still breathing. If they're not breathing, then what we would do is we would breathe for them. But this is what we're going to do until help would arrive. What about someone who's uh, conscious but whom you suspect has uh, taken poison? Well, in the conscious victim, the big thing that we have to do is make sure that they maintain that airway the whole time. But making sure that we get help arriving is real important as well. Of course. Yeah. Parents, one of the most important things for parents is to make sure that they have all these access numbers available to them all the time. And the poison control number is a minimum thing that everybody should have available right Put next to the phone. Put that right by the phone. Okay. Just right next to that 911 sticker, you should have your poison control number. Now, if the poison control number is not available, then you can get that again from either your 911 agency or you can get it from your local emergency department. But the first thing you should do to the person is to try to call the poison control center and then if it looks serious enough that you should immediately contact your 911 and get the paramedics the fire department responding to you or of course get to the emergency room if you can do that uh, more quickly that's right and I think in the majority of the case we'd like you to try to use your emergency medical services agency in your in your area now that person very easily can vomit and if that person vomits what we want to do is that in many cases people would like you to contain that vomitus and bring that into the hospital as well as all the other types of poisonings that the person can come in contact with but what we want to do with these people maintain their airway bring in the, any type of material that they may have ingested and if they vomited and to get them to the... Get help right away. Get them going as quick as possible, right? And Baxter, when people are a danger to themselves, either because they've overdosed on medicine or, or they've made an attempt to harm themselves, uh, do they sometimes refuse to be helped, uh, refuse treatment? That's true a lot of times, David, but the thing that we have to make sure is that we worry about them more medically. Now, what I do and I worry about and the fire department worries about a lot of times... Worry about yourself. That's sure. right, is, is that, the, that they may be in danger to themselves, they may be a danger to me or, or to the rescuer as well. How do you handle that? That's a strange situation. Well, I think the biggest thing is, is that it's kind of a sixth sense. So you just have to go in there and you have to kind of feel the environment. And if it looks real, real scary to yourself, then sometimes it's better to let the professionals handle that. Let the fire department or the police department be able to handle it. Uh -huh. If somebody is adamant about not... Uh, or refusing our care, then really there's not much that we can be able to do for them unless they slip into that unconscious state. It's kind of hard to refuse care when you're unconscious and unresponsive. Right. Any questions for Baxter on poisoning? Um, yes. Hi. I'm not sure if this is the right place to ask this question, but I was at this party with a bunch of friends from school, and people are drinking, and a couple of people got really out of hand, like a couple guys got really drunk, and one went out on the lawn, and he threw up, and then he passed out out there. And everybody just kind of left him there with this attitude that it was really funny, you know, but, you know, when people get out of hand drinking like that, it's kind of scary, and I don't know what to do about it. What should you do? Good question. Alcohol is actually a depressant, and in fact is also considered a drug. It's one of the most commonly abused drugs in our nation. And in fact, we need to consider it a depressant just like sleeping pills can be a depressant. And in fact, if you mix alcohol, sleeping pills, or other depressants, it can make a deadly combination. People that drink alcohol go unconscious and can be unresponsive, can vomit, can basically drown on their own vomitus, just like any other person from any other type of overdose or poisoning. And we need to take alcohol very seriously. 
And that, what you stated, the fact that people don't take it seriously, is actually very scary to me. I've seen many people at parties that have actually died when they find them the next day because they just thought, oh, the person's just a little bit drunk. So alcohol does kill, the, very common. The bottom line here is treat that situation exactly the way you would treat a poisoning. Is that right? That's right. In fact, airway, breathing, circulation, and accessing the emergency medical service system, calling 911, is real important. Okay, well, why don't we review what we've learned in this chapter? To review, Chapter 10 on Poisoning. For the unconscious victim, make sure it's safe to enter the scene. Check the victim's ABCs. Call 911. If they vomit, roll the victim on his or her side. For the conscious victim, once again make sure it's safe to enter the scene. Check the victim's ABCs. Call the poison control center in your area. Should the victim vomit, save the vomitous material for medical personnel to evaluate. Gather the poison or poison container. If you don't understand any of these procedures, please review this chapter. This chapter addresses a medical emergency which often changes the victim's life forever. Strokes. And with us again is Baxter Larman. What can you tell us about first aid for the victim of a stroke, Baxter? Well, David, probably the first thing that we should do is just talk about the brain itself. The brain is a unique organ. It's very similar to the heart when we were talking about the heart earlier. And the heart itself had vessels that were all on the outside of it that were mm -hmm. called coronary arteries, if you remember. In our brain, we have cerebral arteries. These arteries' job is to basically bring a blood supply to the brain. Now, in the heart, what had happened is those vessels would become occluded, either be blocked by some impurity in the blood, by blood clots itself, or they could become narrowed. Also what can happen is these blood vessels can actually rupture. Now what happens when a rupture happens is it deprives our brain, like it did in our heart, of oxygen. In our heart it caused us to have a heart attack, but in our brain it causes us to have what's commonly known as a stroke. Okay, so uh, either because of a blockage or some other reason we have an impaired blood flow, we have a stroke. Uh, uh, what are some of the signs? How does that stroke manifest itself on the victim? Well, I think one of the things we need to talk about is like we talked about with the heart attack victim, is that you don't need all of these signs to appear. Any one of these signs or a combination thereof can be a red flag that there's a major problem going on or symptoms of a stroke and that we want to access and get help coming to us as soon as possible. Now, the most common sign that we'll find out in these people is that first, they'll lots of times experience a headache. And the headache they experience is a unique type of a headache. It's usually like the worst type of headache they've ever had in their life, migraine type of a headache. Um, it may be light or sound type of sensitive. It's usually generalized in their head. It's usually not localized in any one spot. The other thing is, is that these people can get a blurred vision or they can also get a speech impairment where they're unable to speak or they may not be able to understand you speaking to them. They also may get a weakness in one side of their body as compared to the other, a droopness in their face, a problem in being able to feel or touch on one hand, or they can get complete paralysis on one side of the body versus the other. When a stroke gets to a severe state, basically the patient can go unconscious and completely unresponsive, which is very difficult to be able to determine that they're actually having a stroke. And then also one of the signs of a stroke can be a seizure. Uh, when the brain does not get good oxygen, it, the patient can basically go into a full seizure. And, and the seizure being what? How would we recognize that? Well, a seizure, we're really going to be bringing up in another chapter that's going to be coming up, in fact, I think right after this. Okay. Well, we'll deal with that then. Okay. What, uh, what first aid techniques can we use for a person that's, uh, that's experiencing these symptoms? Well, treatment is actually very important to do as soon as you can on a stroke patient because anything that we can do for this person may alleviate further problems and complications that can go down later and can save us a lot of time in rehabilitation as well for these patients. There's two types of stroke patients. We have the conscious patient and we have the unconscious victim of a stroke. Now in the conscious victim, the first thing that we can do is first try to recognize that they're having a problem in those signs that we just talked sure, about. Sure. Now after we've recognized one of those signs, what we need to do is we try to make the patient feel a little bit more comfortable. It's very similar to the heart attack victim. 
that we recognize that the person had a problem, and we sit them down, we try to make them comfortable. Check the ABCs, probably. We yeah, check their airway, breathing, right. circulation. We remove any type of restrictive clothing, make them as comfortable as possible, and then we want to access and dial up the 911 system sure. as soon as possible. That's pretty much what we need to do on the conscious victim. And the unconscious victim, which, of course, would be like uh, many other kinds of injuries, where you'd have to identify it to begin with. You're right, and that's the hard thing, is to identify when you find this person down on the ground. They're not conscious. They can't tell you some of these signs and symptoms. So in the unconscious person that's down on the ground, really what we're going to do is do those basics, that airway, breathing, circulation, make sure that we've accessed the 911 system. The one thing to understand about these people that are unconscious is that those are the more severe types of strokes. These people are very prone to vomiting. And if you remember earlier mm -hmm. when a person vomits, we want to rotate that person to the side and we want to get all that material out of their mouth as soon as possible, turn their head back and maintain that airway. And remember, if they're not breathing, to make sure that we breathe for them. And if they're not circulating blood, that we need to circulate that blood. Right. Baxter, since blood flow to the brain is clearly crucial here, is there a relationship between high blood pressure and stroke? Uh, very much. And one of the things that we keep trying to tell people throughout on the video library is that prevention is very important. And a simple thing, and going to your doctor and having your blood pressure taken, or there's plenty of clinics you know, Yeah, that are you available. don't even have to go to your doctor. There. You can do it at a drugstore. There are a lot of places to do it. And blood pressure is an easy thing to have checked. And hypertension, which is also known as high blood pressure, is actually a big killer. And it can be maintained very easily by just minimal medications. And informing yourself of exactly what your blood pressure is. Important to do. Yeah, and also what can really help the health professionals is not only have your blood pressure taken, but, but ask the person, what was my blood pressure? Sure. So when you go to the hospital, you'll have a baseline of telling them what your normal blood pressure is. Baxter, there are a lot of people that take uh, blood pressure medication, but apparently uh, they either stop taking it or they forget to take it. Why is that such a problem? It's funny that people that take medications oftentimes have no associated symptoms that why they take that medication, and hypertension is one of those reasons. They don't feel different whether they take it or not. That's right, and what ends up happening is they get kind of a false sense of security, and they just kind of feel all right why they're taking their medicine, right. so they say, well, I just don't need to take my medicine anymore. I don't anymore. need this today, right? That's right. Yeah. And then what ends up happening is in the interim, they basically increase their blood pressure higher and higher and higher. They don't go to the doctor as prescribed. They don't get their blood pressure checked, and their blood pressure gets higher and higher and higher, and, and all of a sudden they'll have that the stroke. the result may be a stroke. That's right. Okay. That's right. Well, thank you. That's, okay. that's a terrific amount of information for us to absorb. So why don't we review Chapter 11 before we move on? To review, Chapter 11 on strokes. For the conscious victim, you must first recognize the signals of stroke, then immediately make the victim stop all activity. Have them sit or lie down, whichever is more comfortable. Call 911 immediately. For the unconscious victim, make sure that it's safe to enter the scene. Check the victim's ABCs. Call 911. Should the stroke victim vomit, turn the victim on his or her side. If you don't understand any of these procedures, please review this chapter. Seizures, one of the most frightening and least understood medical emergencies. Chapter 12 of the emergency first aid videotape contains important information about seizures. Baxter, what's a seizure? Well, David, as you said, they are incredibly frightening to the person that witnesses a seizure. And it's also interesting to see that people call them a lot of different things. And I think that's one thing that we need to kind of put together is, is that some people call seizures epilepsy. Epilepsy is actually a disease process. Just because somebody has a seizure does not necessarily mean that they have this disease called epilepsy that we're going to explain in a little bit. Now, Julius Caesar was a famous epileptic. And exactly. There were many others throughout history. Exactly. Um, you'll find that, that also people may call them convulsions. People may call them fits. All those are basically a, the same terminology that we use as seizures. But one of the things is, is that seizures are kind of an incontrollable muscle activity that you'll find in the body and that all of our organs are basically out of wire because of our brain. And our brain is what's really going to cause the seizure problem. But what, what does cause it? What's the physiology of it? Well, first off is that these people may have these 
uncontrollable states that seem like a long period of time. When you're watching a seizure on the ground, it seems like this person's having it for hours at times, right. when only sometimes it lasts like 30 to 40 seconds. And what happens in a seizure is that it can be caused by a lot of different things, but commonly it's some type of an insult to the brain itself. Things like alcohol, things like drugs, um, accidents can cause it where you may have bleeding inside the brain. Um, tumors, such as probably what happened in Julius Caesar, is he may have had uh, a tumor in his brain that can have it, and also birth defects can cause people to have seizures. And physiologically, the basic problem is, is that we have an electrical short to our computer, which is what our brain is. And depending on where that short circuit is, depends on what type of activity you're actually going to find that's going to dysfunction. Well, uh, are there different types of seizures? Yeah, you'll, you'll notice that in some cases, if you have a full body seizure or a full brain seizure that the whole brain itself is activated and it is short circuited is that they may have something called a grand mal seizure. I don't mm -hmm. know if you've ever heard that before. Sure. But in a grand mal seizure it's indicative that the person is unconscious and unresponsive. And you'll also find out that their full body may be basically convulsive and very tight when you notice it. The other thing that you'll see is there's a uh, type of a seizure known as petit mal or petite mal seizure, and they're focal type seizures. They may be only a small little short in that computer of our brain, and it may make a person just have a seizure in one side of their face, on just one side of their body, maybe just in their lower extremities is where these type of seizures may happen. All right, so I encounter a victim who's engaged in a major seizure, there's all kinds of violent movement. What do I do? Well, I think the easiest way is to demonstrate it for you, so why sure. don't we come on over here? Um, as you said, this person is violently having a seizure. All their arms and legs are moving about. The first thing that I might do is uh, we need to clear the environment. So if oh. you can move this chair for me. Sure. The next thing is, is that we want to make sure that someone is going and getting help. So activating the 911 system. I'm going to come up and my priority is always airway, so I'm going to tip the person's head back. This patient does have a good airway. The next thing that you'll notice is that seizure patients' arms and legs are flaring about and so is their head lots of times and this head is going to be bouncing up and down on the ground and it causes them to get a bad laceration lots of times on the back of their head. So what I simply do is I place my hand right back here and I kind of protect that head area here. And you want to be careful that it's with your hand, really. More than, you'll find people stuff pillows and blankets under there and what that'll do is it forces the head forward it like this. Close the airway, right? Exactly. Now exactly. let me ask you are, you, are you, are you restricting the movement at all or are you simply protecting the head? We're trying to protect the head as much as we can. I see. These people get those large lacerations on the back of their head but, that we want so to... So do, you don't want to contain the movement, simply protect it. Exactly. Okay. The same thing is true on their arms. Their arms will have a tendency to move out and by basically trying to restrict that movement, you know, you'll notice that they'll actually break their bones, and that's real common in elderly people and also in children. I see. The next thing that you're going to do is, is that it's very common for us when we arrive at a person's home to find that people have stuck things into the person's mouth. We'll find spoons, oh, sure. pliers, yeah. we find all kinds of things, pencils, even people's fingers that they'll put into a person's mouth. Absolutely nothing goes in the victim's Bad mouth. Bad for the person? Bad for the finger? Bad right. for the rescuer, okay. exactly. Right. So we want to basically not put anything in their mouth. We want to maintain and watch the area for their seizure activity, remove things from the okay. environment, and protect their airway. And you said this lasts maybe 45 seconds or so? 45 seconds or more, but right. it's rare that it lasts more than 45 seconds. Now, only two things can really happen after the seizure. One of them is that they will not regain consciousness. The other one is, is that they will slowly start to regain their consciousness, but they'll be slightly disoriented. We call that a post-ictal state, yes. after seizure state. Uh -huh. And in that case, the patient is very disoriented and you need to stay with them and constantly reassure them and try to also reorient them continuously. Now the other thing that can happen is that after their seizure, they may not be breathing. So and the seizure itself can actually end because they're not breathing? Why is that? Right, and actually in a grand mal seizure, you are not breathing while you're having that seizure. Why is that? Well, that muscle that we talked about earlier... The diaphragm? Right, the yeah. diaphragm that separates your chest compartment and your abdominal compartment here. Right. That muscle, like any other muscle in your body, is violently it's constricting. So does that go into spasm? Is that it goes into okay. spasm and basically you're not breathing during that. So what you would need to do would be to breathe the victim at that point. You would have to breathe the victim. And again, not necessarily mm -hmm. would you have to do all the elements of CPR, right. but you're going to need to make sure that they have a good airway and you're going to have to breathe for the victim if they're not breathing. If they did not have a pulse, 
you would compress their chest. But in the majority of the time, these people are not going to be breathing and do have a pulse. Right. Let me ask you, um, in terms of children, is, is there a, a, a different uh, phenomenon that goes on? Well, children are real interesting. Uh, there's a lot more causes of seizures in adults than there are in children. And predominantly in children, the cause is, is by a high fever that we know, know as a febrile uh, seizure. Yeah. And the thing with febrile seizures is we want to cool the child down as soon as possible, but that's only after the seizure itself has actually sure, happened. Sure. And the way that we do that is we don't want to use alcohol, which is what a lot of people use. Alcohol can actually cause a lot more problems than it can actually do good. And we also don't want to use cold water. Cold water actually causes shivering in the child, and shivering is a protective mechanism for us to try to maintain okay. our body temperature. No alcohol, no cold water. Right, basically. Anything else? We just want to use regular tepid water, just regular, basically 98 degree water, put it on the child, take, the, take a cloth, place it on the child, lift the cloth off, right. on and off, and by evaporation, we take heat with that, and that'll cool the child down slightly. Thanks very much, Baxter. Remember, no matter what the cause of the seizure, it's very important to have the patient evaluated by a doctor. Now, this has been a lot of information that we've covered, so to review, let's look at the information cards on Chapter 12. To review, Chapter 12 on seizures. In case of seizure, before assisting the victim, make sure that it's safe to enter the scene. Check the victim's ABCs. Call 911. Protect the victim from harming him or herself. Do not place a pillow under his or her head or try to restrict movement. Do not place anything in the victim's mouth. If you don't understand any of these procedures, please review this chapter. Joining us for this segment on heat illness is Fire Captain Don Taylor. John, just before we began this, you asked me which American disaster in this century took the most lives. What was that about? It was the heat wave and drought of 1988. You're kidding me. No, I'm not kidding. More lives were lost due to heat illnesses during the summer of 88 than were lost due to any other disaster during the century. Well, we've already learned that extremes of cold can be very serious for the human body. I guess extremes of heat can be the same thing. It reminds us of how fragile the human body is. Yeah, the, the death toll of the summer of 88 should convince us that this is a very important chapter. For example, when the temperature climbs 25 to 30 degrees above normal, most people, or a lot of people, suffer from one or more forms of heat illness. These illnesses are compounded by high humidity. What, what are the forms of heat illness? The three most common types are uh, heat cramps, heat exhaustion, and heat stroke. Heat cramps should be considered the least serious and heat stroke the most serious. Exactly what happens during these heat illnesses? The human body uses fluids in the form of perspiration to regulate body temperature. Perspiration on the skin allows the body to cool, but if the body has lost much of its fluid content, it's unable to produce the sufficient perspiration needed to regulate the body temperature. That's when heat illnesses strike. So I would imagine that would be mostly during times of uh, strenuous physical activity or high humidity. Right? Right. Uh, heat cramps usually do occur during the high temperatures. For example, the youngster who plays hard on a hot summer afternoon. Mm -hmm. What are some of the signs of uh, heat cramps? There are stomach cramps, severe pain in the arms and legs, and pale, damp skin. To care for the victim of heat cramps, you need to get them into a cool place and lay them down face up. And if they're fully conscious, give them a half a glass of water every 15 minutes but never try to give liquids to a person who is unconscious. Also, you should call 911 or your appropriate emergency number in your area. Okay, now what about heat exhaustion? Is that different? Yes, it's more severe than heat cramps, and it results from a severe loss of body fluids. This can occur as a result of heavy perspiration, vomiting, diarrhea, or heavy alcohol consumption. And what are some of those signs? The signs of uh, heat exhaustion are a little different you have a cool, damp skin, a rapid pulse, and a high body temperature between 102 and 104 degrees Fahrenheit, nausea, headache and dizziness, difficulty with vision, irritability in their moods or behavior, and mild cramps. Well, suppose we identify somebody with uh, one or more of those symptoms. How do we treat them? Well, you have to get the person into a cool or a shady place and have them lay down face up and loosen their clothing. Then again, if the victim's fully conscious, 
give them a half a glass of water every 15 minutes. But remember, never give a person who is unconscious any liquids or anything to drink. Essentially, that's the same treatment as for heat cramps. And, and in addition to that, we would call 911 probably right. as well, right? Right, right. Well, what about heat stroke? I imagine that's the most serious, the most deadly, at least potentially, of all of these conditions. Yes, it is. And it requires proper first aid and prompt emergency care by medical personnel. Heat stroke is when the body loses all ability to regulate the body temperature and effectively cool itself. It affects elderly people most often, and it usually occurs on warm summer afternoons after strenuous activity or long-term exposure to hot, humid conditions. And, and how would we identify heat stroke uh, as we look at the victim? The signs of a heat stroke include a body temperature over 104 degrees Fahrenheit, hot, dry skin, a very rapid pulse and breathing, and a flushed appearance, nausea, weakness and dizziness, and confusion or coma. All of those symptoms sound uh, very serious. So we, we identify someone with one or more of those symptoms. What do we do? You have to get them to a cool, shady area and call 911 or your local emergency number. This is a life-threatening situation, I take it. Yes, it is. All right, we have a demonstration set up to illustrate some first aid techniques for the uh, victim of a heat stroke. Yeah, remember, this is a life-threatening emergency, and we have to cool this victim quickly. So while waiting for the EMS personnel to arrive, you should remove the victim's clothing and cover the victim with a wet sheet. If available, turn on a fan or air conditioner to help cool this victim. In trying to cool victims of heat illnesses, remember, never use rubbing alcohol on their skin. It might evaporate quickly, but it can absorb into the skin and aggravate the victim's medical condition. All right. Don, thanks very much. I know you're going to be back in the next segment, but before that, why don't we review some of the major points about heat illnesses? To review, Chapter 13, Heat Illness. For victims with heat cramps or heat exhaustion, make sure it's safe to enter the area. Check the victim's ABCs. Move the victim to a cool place and lie him or her down. Give the victim half a glass of water every 15 minutes. Call 911 if necessary. Do not give an unconscious person anything to drink. Heat stroke is a life-threatening emergency. Check and make sure it is safe to enter the area. Check the victim's ABCs. Call 911. Move the victim to a cool place. Remove his or her clothing and immediately cool the victim. If you don't understand any of these procedures, please review this chapter. Don, I, uh, I want you to meet a friend of mine. Jamie, come in here. Hi, how are you? Nice to see you again. Jamie McKinnon, this is Don Taylor. Nice meeting you, Jamie. Why don't we sit down? Um, Don, Jamie has a little problem. Oh, really? Yeah. How can I help you? Sometimes I get nosebleeds. You do? And what do you do to stop them? My mom gives me a washcloth, and I pinch my nose with it. And I hold my head down, and I have to hold it for a long time. That sounds like the right thing to do, doesn't it? That's exactly what you're supposed to do. And nosebleeds are exactly what we're going to talk about next. Nosebleeds are usually more of a nuisance than an emergency, David. I'd say the vast majority of nosebleeds are not even life-threatening. They are caused by some sort of trauma, it's like being struck on the nose or sometimes a result from the drying of the inside of the nose mm -hmm. due to high altitude or low humidity. Head colds with vigorous nose blowing sometimes cause nosebleeds. Jamie, could you do us a favor? Could you sit up here and... Uh... Don, why don't you show us what we can do to control bleeding from the nose? To provide first aid for a nosebleed, have the victim sit up, lean forward, and tilt the head down. This prevents swallowing of blood. Calm the victim and have them pinch the entire nose for at least 10 minutes. And don't let go to check for bleeding during this period. Holding a cool, damp washcloth across the bridge of the nose sometimes causes the blood vessels to restrict and stops the bleeding sooner. What about ice? Is that an effective way of controlling the bleeding? No, do not apply ice. Ice can cause frostbite. If the nosebleed cannot be controlled with pressure, and that's by pinching the nose for 10 minutes or more, mm -hmm. transport the victim to a hospital. Unless it appears that the victim is suffering from shock, Remember, rapid transportation is not required. What if the victim has a blood disorder of some kind and you know about that? If the victim uh, has some problem with high blood pressure or tumors in the nose 
a nosebleed should be considered a possible emergency. Normally, nosebleeds can be cared for as we have described here. If they occur frequently, however, the victim should be seen by a physician and given a thorough physical examination. All right, Jamie, did you get all that? Yeah. Yeah, you understood it? Uh huh. All right, you were super. Thank you. Don, thanks so much for being with us. Thank you. Uh, please refer to your Chapter 14 reference cards and we'll review. To review, Chapter 14. For a nosebleed, sit the victim down and lean his or her head forward. Pinch the nose for at least 10 minutes. Apply a cool, damp cloth if available. Do not use ice. If you don't understand any of these procedures, please review this chapter. Our last chapter in the First Aid Video Library is about drowning. And rejoining us for this segment is Baxter Larman. You know, Baxter, I was surprised to learn, astounded actually, that there were over 5,600 drownings in the United States alone last year. And the frightening part of that, David, is, is that a lot of those drownings were preventable. Uh, people think that you have to drown in a lake mm. or in an ocean, but actually it's more common for people to actually drown in a home pool, in a jacuzzi, or in children's cases, we get a significant amount of them that are kept unsupervised in a bathtub. Sure, they can drown in that much water. Just probably. inches of water, yeah. It makes what, it real sad. What actually happens in a drowning? Well, what happens is, is that when a person is submerged underwater, is that water either goes in through your nose or in through your mouth, it goes back here to the back part of your throat, mm -hmm. and when it comes and it touches this unique little muscle back here, known as your epiglottis, its function basically is when anything touches it, is to slam shut across the top part of your windpipe known as your larynx. So the water doesn't actually go down into the lungs then? No, and in fact that's a misconception a lot of people think is, is that your lungs have to fill up with water, and in fact that's not what happens. What happens is, is that you're not able to get air into your lungs. Right. So you asphyxiate not from the water, you asphyxiate from not getting any uh, air into your lungs. Are there any uh, techniques for approaching a drowning victim? Anything that we should remember? Well, the biggest thing that we want to remind our viewers is, is to not go in and rescue the victim without, one, understanding your own limitations, or two, try to use some of the things that may be in the environment, a buoy that may be around, right, right. or in a lot of pools they have a pole with a hook on it that you can try to retrieve the person. And if the person is in the pool, and, and is a conscious, if you go in after them, many times they'll drag and submerge you underwater and you in turn can also make yourself at a high risk for drowning. Of course, if the water is shallow and it's a child, that's obviously safe to go and, and retrieve the child. Obviously, that would make it much easier to be able to pull them out of the water. Um, and if the person is unconscious and un unresponsive, you can go in after them, but again, if you're not a good swimmer, that's a great risk for yourself and it may be better for you to wait and ask for the professionals to come and have them actually remove the person well, from let's, the water. Let's, let's assume that we have the drowning victim out of the pool now. What are, what are some of the first aid procedures that we need to remember here? Well, they're very easy, and it's probably easiest to go and demonstrate it here. And okay. if we look over here, good. the first thing we're going to do is we're going to shake and shout at the victim. Are you all right? Are you all right? We call for assistance. Make sure someone is coming to us. We're going to go ahead and tip that head back. Then we're going to listen, look, and feel and find out if the person is breathing. We're going to do that for five seconds again. In this case, the patient is not breathing, so we're going to pinch the nose on the child and we're going to breathe for him. The thing to remember is it's a lot more difficult to get ventilations into the drowning victim because of that little muscle that we call the epiglottis across your windpipe. So you have to breathe harder to be able to blow that open. And when we breathe the child after those two breaths, we want to check the pulse. In this case, the child does have a pulse but is not breathing, and we want to continue to breathe the child. He's checking the pulse at the neck, right? Right. Okay. And the next thing is, is that what's real common with drowning victims is that they will bring up water. Now, that water more commonly comes from the stomach than it is from the lungs, so what we would have to do is immediately, when the child is vomiting, is rotate that child to the side and let all that water come out of the mouth. And as soon as the water is done coming out, we're going to want to reposition the child on their back, we want to open that air passage, and we're going to want to breathe the child. That's how quick we can be able to do it. Sometimes a drowning victim has injured himself, uh, a blow on the head from diving or something. What's the priority here? Cle clearly to take care of the breathing? Right, airway, breathing, and circulation. Yet, at the same time, we don't want to manipulate and move the child around anymore and cause him any further injury. But again, as you said, priorities, airway, breathing, and circulation. Suppose the victim appears to be dead. Should we proceed anyway? 
Yeah, th these people lots of times have a, a very, if, if it's a white pigmentation skin, it's a blackish, bluish appearance. Dark pigmentation is a very whitish, kind of a uh, waxy type of appearance. Uh -huh. And don't look at things like that. Go ahead and resuscitate. Start doing your airway breathing procedures immediately on and, the patient. And try to get emergency help, obviously. Exactly. Now, I have heard of instances, I think we all have, where children have, have fallen into very cold water, been apparently drowned, been underwater for 45 minutes, 25 minutes, something like that, and yet lived. Can you uh, talk about that a little bit? Yeah, uh, that's a very interesting phenomenon. And basically, what ends up happening to that is that when you're submerged underwater in cold water, your brain and all the other organs in your body basically slow down and use a lot less oxygen than they would, for instance, if you fell down right here and were not breathing. So it's a kind of adaptive mechanism. Huh? Right. We might call, some people call it the diving reflex. It's the same thing that happens to whales and to right. seals when they right. go underwater. All their body slows down. And what happens is, is you can do without oxygen for a longer period of time. So once again, our job is basically to recognize that they're a near drowning victim to pull them out and to start doing airway breathing uh, circulation procedures immediately. Yeah, so clearly uh, there's every reason to try to revive the victim, no matter what the circumstances, no matter what his or her appearance is. Right. Okay, good. I think there's some uh, questions in the audience. Uh, yes, sir. Yes, um, what about good swimmers who get caught in rough water, get tired, or just can't make it to safety? I've heard there's something called drown proofing. What's that all about? Um, Interesting point. Uh, Drown-proof swimming is basically a technique that people have used and uh, safety people teach as a way to be able to conserve your own body energy if you're ever stuck out in the middle of the ocean someplace or in a lake and may have a long swim to be able to get back or to have to wait for help to arrive. It's just, that, once again, a way to be able to conserve energy and also a, ba a way to basically keep yourself as warm as possible. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, yes, when I was in the service, we were taught to revive people who drown by pushing and pulling on their arms. Is that method still used? That's a great question, sir, that confuses a lot of people. Actually, that used to be the technique that we would use for artificial respiration. And today, what we're doing is we're actually doing mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation along and with a combination, if there is no pulse, of chest compressions known today as cardiopulmonary resuscitation. That technique has been devised since the early 60s and has actually the preferable choice now and not the old face down, press on the back, lift up the arm technique. Thank you for your question. And thank you, Baxter. It's been a pleasure having you here. Thank you. Now, why don't we review our last chapter on drowning? To review, Chapter 15, Drowning. Make sure the area is safe to enter. Check the victim's ABCs. Call 911 or your local EMS phone number. If the victim is vomiting, roll the victim on his or her side. If you don't understand any of these procedures, please review this chapter. Now, coming up shortly is another test you can give yourself to see how much you've learned on take two of the first aid video library. But before we do that, why don't we hear once again from your sponsor, the publisher of the Journal of Emergency Medical Services and Rescue Magazine, Mr. Jim Page. Welcome back. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you, David, and we really appreciate the nice job you've done with this program. Well, thanks. It's a pleasure to be here, and I've learned an enormous amount. Throughout this program, you've heard us refer to official rescuers. We've told you again and again to call 911. We've talked about trained emergency medical dispatchers. You've learned a lot of information in this presentation. Besides first aid, the information that you or bystanders relate to the emergency dispatcher can be very critical. Let's take a moment to go over them. First, you have to tell the dispatcher what kind of emergency has taken place. For example, you might tell the dispatcher that there's a man having a heart attack or that there's been a car accident. Next, you need to tell them the exact location of the emergency, the telephone number that you're using to make the call, your name the number of victims and their condition, if known, and finally, what help, if any, is being provided. Don't hang up until instructed by the dispatcher. Now, this might seem time-consuming, but it is essential that the EMS dispatcher has this information so that they may send the appropriate emergency personnel and equipment to the scene. Now, you should be aware that there are places where there is no universal emergency telephone number. Worst of all, there may be places in the United States where the official rescuers 
themselves may not be trained to do anything more than basic first aid. Through our publications, we try to keep the pressure on those places, but we need your help. I urge you to investigate the quality of emergency medical services where you live and work. Has your community adopted a universal emergency telephone number? Have the dispatchers who would receive your call been trained as emergency medical dispatchers? Do they have approved medical guidelines to use? Together, we have a very personal interest in doing the right things when a life is on the line. And together, we can fight to make sure that every community in America provides the kind of emergency care system we all deserve. Welcome to America's emergency care team, and congratulations. Jim, thanks very much for putting together this presentation. And this concludes the First Aid Videotape Library. I hope you've learned as much as I did. And to ensure that you get the most out of this presentation, we've prepared a test that you can take. Now, don't be discouraged if you didn't grasp everything the first time around. Along with your reference cards, you can always go back and review those chapters you need help on. This is David Burney, and on behalf of Jim Page and the Journal of Emergency Medical Services, thanks for joining us. Like our test questions from part one of the Emergency First Aid Video Library, questions for part two will have multiple choice and true or false statements. Do your best to choose the correct answer. Question number one. What should you do first to control severe bleeding? A. Apply a tourniquet. B. Apply direct pressure to the wound. C. Call 911. The correct answer is B. Apply direct pressure to the wound. Question number two. In all cases of shock, you should elevate the victim's legs. True or false? The statement is false. If the legs are injured, do not elevate the victim's legs. Question number three. While cooking, you spill a pan of boiling water on your arm. What should you do first? A. Stop the burning and place your arm under cool running water. B. Do nothing. Wait for the pain to go away and wrap the arm with sterile gauze. C. After the burn cools, spread butter or margarine over the burn. The correct answer is A. Stop the burning and place your arm under cool running water. Question number four. The first aid for frostbite includes which of the following? A. Place the frostbitten area under cold running water. B. Hold the affected area over an open flame or other heat source. C. Rewarm the frostbitten area in water with a temperature between 100 and 105 degrees Fahrenheit. The correct answer is C. Rewarm the frostbitten area in water with a temperature between 100 and 105 degrees Fahrenheit. Question number five. You think that a friend may be having a stroke. He is conscious. What should you do? A. Make sure that he has an open airway and is breathing. Place him in a comfortable position and see that 911 is called immediately. B. Rush your friend to the nearest hospital. C. Get him to bed right away. Call the doctor if his symptoms get worse. The correct answer is A. Make sure that he has an open airway and is breathing. Place him in a comfortable position and see that 911 is called immediately. Question number six. If the person in the previous question were to suddenly go unconscious, what should you do? A. Administer oxygen if available. B. Position him on his back, check the ABCs, and have someone call 911. C. Drive him directly to the hospital. The correct answer is B. Position him on his back, check the ABCs, and have someone call 911. Question number seven. Your three-year-old daughter is holding an empty container of finger paint. She has paint on her face and says her tummy hurts. What should you do? A. Try to make her vomit. B. Give her a glass of water or milk to drink. C. 
Call the poison control center in your area immediately. D. Read the label on the bottle of finger paint and follow the instructions. The correct answer is C. Call the poison control center in your area immediately. Question number eight. A woman is having a seizure. You should hold her down and restrict her movements and then stick something in her mouth to keep her from biting her tongue. True or false? The correct answer is false. Do not restrict the movement of a person having a seizure and never place anything in his or her mouth. Question number nine. A man in your swimming pool is flailing and shouting for help. What should you do when you get to the poolside? A. Jump in and try to save him. B. Try to throw him a life ring or a line, then reach out to him from the poolside. C. Call 911. The correct answer is B. Try to throw him a life ring or a line, then reach out to him from the poolside. Question number 10. When calling 911 in a medical emergency, what information is important for the emergency dispatcher to know? A. How many persons are injured? B. The exact location of the emergency. C. The telephone number from where you are calling. D. What type of emergency it is? E. All of the above. The correct answer is E. All of the above. The emergency dispatcher will need to know how many persons are injured, the location, the telephone number that you're calling from, and what type of emergency is involved. This is so that the emergency dispatcher can dispatch the appropriate emergency personnel and equipment to the scene as soon as possible. This concludes the questions for part two of the emergency first aid video library. If you made mistakes, go back and review those chapters.